Welcome everyone to the Henderson Lecture of the Henderson Summer Leadership Conference. I'm Helen Blyer and I serve as the Director of Continuing Education and I'm broadcasting to you from the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary office, uh, which is located on the ancestral lands of the Osage and Shawnee peoples. Together with my planning partner, the Reverend Libby Barlow, the Executive Minister of Christian Associates of Southwest Pennsylvania, we're delighted to gather with all of you who share with us a hope to heal what is broken in the world. Before I introduce our wonderful speaker, I'd like to share a word about the history of this event and its namesake. The Reverend Dr. J. Hubert Hub Henderson had deep ties to this seminary. In addition to being a distinguished alumnus, he served as a member of the board of directors of PTS for 27 years. However, he was first and foremost a pastor serving the Wallace Memorial Presbyterian Church for 35 years until his retirement in 1979. He did so with great love and a deep commitment to what church was called to be. I'd like to recognize Hub's children who continue to support this event and when possible, join us. The Reverend Dick Henderson and his wife, Sheila Henderson, Marge Henderson Johnston and her husband, Ed Johnston, Bob Henderson and his wife Sue Henderson, and Tom Henderson. As a pastor, Hub exercised prophetic leadership and challenged his church community to live the same. He did good, important work, work needed by both church and community. But more than that, when I hear stories about him, I am struck by how much he loved his work, yes, how much he loved God, and how much he loved the people too. He manifested the courage to stand in the space between competing ideologies to bear witness to something deeper, bigger, and more just, a conviction in our shared humanity and a deep faith in the capacity for communities, like the church, to contribute to the healing of the world. I'm grateful for his legacy, which bore witness to the theme of this conference, that religion can indeed be a means for advancing the common good, and that the particularity of our identities doesn't have to draw a line that separates us one from the other. And this is clearly a hope shared by all of you and by so many around the world. We have nearly 250 people registered for the whole conference from three continents. Perhaps one of the results of this year has been in the midst of our separation one from each other, we realize how much we really do need and impact each other. Indeed, we felt the gut-wrenching, grief-inducing reality of twin pandemics, both of which have proclaimed, I can't breathe, the pandemic of racism and other social constructs that divide us, and the pandemic of COVID-19. But as the speaker says in the introduction to her book, this breathlessness that results from this breathlessness can point to us a sign of our own bravery, that we are awake and we want things to be different. And I'm very mindful that we are hosting this event in the wake of Pentecost, the Christian feast, which also matches the feast of Shavuot in the Jewish community. These moments marking new insight into what it means to share life with each other in community. I first came to know of Valerie Kaur in 2016 through the election watch night speech she retells at the beginning of her book, See No Stranger. I was transfixed and allowed hope to creep into my assessment of what had just taken place. Valerie is an activist, a filmmaker, a civil rights attorney. She is a person of deep faith and a parent. She is the founder of the Revolutionary Love Project. And she is a go-to wise woman when so many of us seek direction in how to navigate what seem to be incommensurable divides. I take inspiration and strategy, as well as new ways of thinking about this immense work that we have ahead of us from her and her words. But more than that, I also take joy. And I have no doubt you will as well. And with that, welcome 
Valerie. It is a delight to have you with us. Thank you so much, Helen. That was so beautiful and warm. Thank you. You are Thank so you. welcome. <laughs> I wish I could be with you in person. And I hope one day that uh, will be true for all of us. Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, I have watched you and walked alongside you from afar in the wake of the massacre at Tree of Life some years ago. And in the thick of that crisis to see how you came together in community and in Helen's words, asserted that we are not separate that deep solidarity can be found in darkness. And that in fact is our salvation. So here we are, my loves, gathering in another dark moment in our country. The future feels dark, doesn't it? Uncertain as the pandemic rages on, as we are hitting the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder and still our nation is in the midst of racial reckonings. As we are hearing news of coming climate catastrophes in my home street of California, more wildfires on the horizon as we are still reckoning with the assaults on our democracy that we have seen in the last year alone. In this darkness still we gather. And in the solidarity, some moral clarity for how to show up to the labor in front of us. So I thank you, Helen, and I thank the Henderson family for allowing me to deliver these words in the memory of their ancestor, Reverend Henderson. I thank Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and I thank all of you who are finding a way to turn this virtual space into a sacred space. Let our time together tonight give you the nourishment that you might need to be brave with your life now and next. So to open that sacred space tonight, I want to give you a greeting from my faith, from the Sikh faith. Vaheguruji ka khalsa, Vaheguruji ki fateh. The beloved community belongs to divine oneness and so does all that it achieves. I invite you to place your feet on the earth And you can close your eyes or lower your eyes for a moment as you let breath into your body, let it come. Let it go. Let yourself arrive here and now. And imagine for a moment with me the indigenous ancestors of the land beneath you. If you know your, their names, you can let their names come to your lips. The Tongva people. Let us honor their resilience and their wisdom, their struggle, past, present, and future. And now I invite you to think of an ancestor who makes you brave. It could be someone from your own family line or someone from history, even recent history. Imagine Reverend Henderson. Imagine John Lewis. Imagine Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Imagine your own grandfather or grandmother. For this moment, just choose one. Good. Oh, and if you are inspired, if they're coming to you easily, you can put their names in the chat. When you have them, you can keep those eyes closed and imagine them standing behind you now. Imagine that they are present to you and that they have some wisdom that you need to know about how to be brave to your life now and next. As you imagine them behind you, I invite you to 
to get curious about what ancestral bravery feels like in your body. I invite you to imagine that all of us here tonight with all of our ancestors behind us are all in one collective space and in our collective body we're holding the collective wisdom of many ancestors. We are holding Alice Hanlon Buck and Granny Hat. We are sensing the bravery of Chris Randy Grimble and Barbara Bozick, Betty Furman, Hazel, Bayard Rustin, Henry Kreutzer, Sister Mary Morgan, Lawrence Carol Woodman, Ruth and Bob Bailey, Blanche Miller, Anna Kiefel, Grandma Brandt, Liana, future ancestor Barack Obama, get your licked, Mary Oliver, James Baldwin, Tony Harrison, Crescent Jensen, mm, and all of the unnamed ancestors who are coming to us now. As you let yourself imagine mm, this virtual space, sacred space filled with many ancestors, now, my love, notice what you are feeling in your body. Helen was right. I always thought that my breathlessness was a sign of my weakness until my first mentor told me what I wish to tell you. No, my love, your breathlessness is a sign of your bravery. It means that you are awake to what is happening right now. The world is in transition. The world needs you, your labor, your love. And to show up to that labor requires a kind of bravery that we cannot ignite on our own. So we are gathering tonight to give each other that bravery, to make one another brave, and to pull from the ancestors. Keep them with you tonight as you hear these words. Opening your eyes, slowly, slowly, slowly. Now, taking a deep breath in, let it come. Mm, let it go. I open this lecture with a story. On January 6th, 2021, I was sitting at this desk when my husband called me downstairs into his office. We have small children who have been with us 24 seven, so we closed the door as they were playing in the kitchen so that he could lift my face up to the television screen. There we saw the insurrection unfolding, heavily armed, mostly white men storming the U.S. Capitol building. And immediately, we received phone calls from his sister-in-law, our sister-in-law, his mother. We were weeping, sobbing, shaking, as we were looking at that screen for my brother-in-law, my husband's brother, was trapped in the U.S. Capitol that day, hiding in his office. He reports for CNN, and so we could only imagine what they would have done if they had found him not only a reporter, but a brown reporter. And so we waited, breathless, watching, knowing what could transpire, what we could be watching in front of us in real time, until finally he was escorted to an undisclosed location and the terror had passed, but not completely. For once he was safe, I could finally feel what was happening in my body. I could finally notice the closing of my throat and the beating of my heart and the shaking of my hands. And I thought, oh, this is terror. This is what terror feels like. And this terror is familiar. For how many times, as a sick American woman in the United States, how many times have I seen loved ones in harm's way in the face of white supremacist 
violence in the last 20 years since September 11th. I was simply feeling what many black and indigenous mothers on the soil have long known, that white supremacist terror is as old as this nation. And as much as we want to protect our loved ones, our brothers, our children from the violence, the most we can do is to put breath back in our bodies and grasp for other hands in the dark who believe it ought not be this way. So I reach out for your hands now, knowing that you too believe it ought not be this way. And that the white supremacist rage that we have seen rise in this country, surge in this country, has been part of our nation all along, hasn't it? It was only a matter of time before that rage became cannibalistic and attacked the very seat of government that had once given it legitimacy. For what were the insurrectionists doing that day? They were storming the U.S. Capitol to stop the peaceful transfer of power to a diverse coalition of leaders that would see me and my family as part of America. As our nation became more and more multiracial, it was only a matter of time before it began to swallow itself. The white supremacist violence that we still must reckon with now. That day, as I was processing the terror in me and feeling the rage that I felt, the need to protect, the inability to protect, the helplessness, the breathlessness, and then breathing again as I was processing all of this, I received a phone call from a very dear friend, a teammate who helped me build the Revolutionary Love Project. And I thought she is reaching for my hand in the dark, isn't she? She's helping me breathe, she's standing with me in solidarity, and she was, but she began with apology. She said, I'm so sorry. I said, no, I, it's okay. She said, my parents were at the Capitol building today. And I said, are they all right? She said, no, you don't understand. They were on the outside of the building, part of the protest. So my brother-in-law was on the inside and her parents were on the outside. And in that moment, I felt the full force of Dr. King's words when he said that we are all bound together in a single garment of human destiny. There is no severing us. Separateness is an illusion. And as much as I wanted to hate the insurrectionists, as much as I wanted to see them as monsters, as, as, one, as much as I wanted to call them evil, I had to see them through the eyes of their daughter, who saw them not as monsters, but as wounded human beings, frail and wounded human beings who whose racial biases were fed by our elected leaders all the way up to the presidency, who were existing in echo chambers of lies and misinformation that they could not help but believe, who, who were radicalized by cultures and institutions that we too were part of. Seeing the wound in them Seeing them through their daughter's eyes did not make them any less dangerous. Manu could have died that day. But it did drain them of their power. For if they are not monsters, but if they are human beings, wounded human beings, then seeing their humanity not only preserves their humanity, it preserves my own. It, it strengthens me to ask what radio stations they're listening to, what websites they are on, what algorithms have led them to believe that, to say that, to do that, who, which elected leaders made it possible for them to inflict violence in the name of patriotism. It made it possible for me to examine the context, context that drive their behavior. 
The subject of tonight's lecture is see no stranger. See no stranger. What does it take? What moral courage does it take to see someone like my brother-in-law inside the Capitol building and someone like her parents on the outside, not as strangers, but as human beings cast in this drama of oppression and assigned different roles? Perpetrator, oppressed, witness. I want to talk to you tonight about the audacity to see no stranger as a practice of love, what I call revolutionary love, and why I believe revolutionary love is the call of our times. For you see the, the torment that we have witnessed in our country, the surges of tyranny and white supremacy and patriarchy, they are not going away under new leadership, are they? These acts of violence, whether through policy or through mass shootings, are signs of a nation in transition. They are actions of people who are terrified of what this nation is becoming. Within 25 years, the number of people of color in the United States will exceed the number of white people for the first time since colonization. We are at a crossroads. Will we? Will we continue to see more images like we saw on January 6th? Will we continue to devolve into a kind of civil war, a, a power struggle with those who wish to return America to a past where only a certain class of white people hold dominion? Or will we begin to birth a nation that has never been? In the history of the world, a nation made up of other nations, a nation that is truly multiracial, multi-faith, multicultural, a nation where we see no stranger, where we see, seek to protect the dignity and the wellness of every single person. When it, when it comes to climate change, we, we know that the stakes are existential, aren't they? You see the same supremacist ideologies that justified colonization, conquest, slavery, those same ideologies justified the rise of industries that accumulate wealth by pillaging the earth and poisoning the skies and darkening the waters. Humanity itself is in transition. Are we on the brink of mass suffering and extinction? Or will we begin to marshal the vision and the skill and the energy to solve this crisis together? We who are alive today will decide whether humanity itself survives or not. Is this? The future is dark. Is this the darkness of the tomb or the darkness of the womb? Some days are so dark that I feel like I can taste the ash in my mouth. The day of the Atlanta massacre, the day of the Indianapolis massacre. Just this last week, seeing all the children pulled from the rubble in Gaza, knowing that whether they are Israeli rockets or Hamas rockets, that it's children pulled from the rubble. Other days. I see glimpses of the nation, the world that is wanting to be born. I see it in you. And the moments when people 
find the courage to reach through the dark and take each other's hands. Anytime people who have had no obvious reason to love one another have come together to grieve, to wail together, to weep together, to say your child is my child, those are the moments that give rise to new relationships and revolutions. Just in the last week, have you seen the images of thousands of Israelis and Palestinians flooding the streets and marches saying, we, it's time to reject the right-wing ideologies that control both of our societies? It's time to lift up a vision of a future that is a shared future, a transformative future, where no more of us have to die. Have you seen those images? Darkness of the womb. I feel like I have seen it in the last year. One year after George Floyd's murder to see images of white people standing in front of black people, kneeling in the streets, in front of an army of police officers. We have never seen those images before, have we? Multiracial uprisings for black lives in this country and all around the globe, asserting a vision of a future where black lives matter. That, that too is the darkness of the womb. I saw it in the last week the last few weeks since the shooting in Indianapolis. You see, I became an activist 20 years ago after Bobir uncle was murdered. He was the first person murdered in a hate crime after 9-11, Bobir Singh Sodhi. He was someone my family knew, so we called him uncle, and his murder turned me into an activist. And 20 years later, with every film, with every f campaign with every lawsuit, I thought we were making the nation safer for the next generation. And now my babies, you may have heard my baby cry just now. <laughs> They're downstairs with my parents. Oh, after they go to bed, that's when it, that's when it gets hard for me. Because after the story time and the dance time, I look into the crib and I, I'm reckoning with the truth that they are growing up in a nation more dangerous for them as little brown children than it was for me. And that one day soon, I will have to tell them about the world and the darkness of it all and the hierarchies of human value that have long ordered this society and where they fall on that hierarchy. And, and in those moments, I will tell them, but my love, you're not alone. There's a critical mass of us now rising up in a way that we were not 20 years ago when I first became an activist. I have seen forms of solidarity I never thought I would see in my lifetime. People like you, reaching through the dark to say, no, your child is my child. Your father, my father. I will fight for you. I will let your grief in my heart. I will stand for you when you are in harm's way. And I will do it visibly, vocally, as a way of moving through the world. Showing up like that is hard. It can be exhausting. So what I want to offer you tonight is nourishment. To get braver than you ever had before. To ask yourself, who have you not yet grieved with? Who have you not yet fought for? Who have you not yet reached out to? For we are here, my loves ready for your solidarity, ready to breathe with you, and ready to push with you, and to show up to that long labor with love. My offering to you tonight is to invite you to make love your compass. When did you first hear the call to love? Now, when did you really hear it? I'm not talking about love as, you know, a rush of feeling or a flood of emotion, the love of Hallmark cards or Valentine's Day even. I'm talking about love as a muscular ethic, a love without limit. When did you first hear it? 
Was it on the lips of one of these ancestors? Was it in a piece of scripture or a story you heard as a child? Was it in a song? I was a little girl growing up on the farmlands of California when I first heard that call to love. My family has lived and farmed here in the Central Valley of California for more than a hundred years. And growing up on that farmland, I grew up with the stories of my ancestors, my sick ancestors. And those stories were about warriors and sages and prophets and poets and laborers and farmers that spanned from India to California. And my favorite story was always the origin story of our faith. Do you know it? My grandfather, Papaji I called him, would scoop me up in his arms and tell me the story of Guru Nanak. I'd like to share it with you now. 550 years ago, a man named Nanak lived in what is now South Asia, Punjab. He was so distraught by the violence around him, the future felt dark to him. The religious persecution, the patriarchy, the tyranny, the oppression, and so he disappeared by a river for three days. The sun rose and the sun fell. The sun rose and the sun fell, and Guru Nanak sat in perfect contemplation and meditation, waiting, seeking the answer. And on the final day, the sun rose and the sun fell, and people thought he was a dead man. People thought he was a drowned man. When he emerged, returned to the village, wonder struck. He had a vision on his lips. Ik, on God. Ik, on God, oneness. That we belong to one another that we can look upon the face of anyone or anything and say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. You are a part of me I do not yet know. That vision of oneness struck Nanak into a state of vismad, wonderment. He saw the world through the eyes of wonder and therefore through the eyes of love. Nako beri nehi bagana. Nako beri nehi bagana. I see no enemy. I see no stranger, said Nanak. I can look upon anyone and say, sister, brother, sibling, we are part of one another. Nanak taught that we could all see the world through this, these eyes, that there is a voice in our heads that separates I from you. It's called Home, H-A-U-M-A-I, Home, the eye that names itself over and against you, that the eye that makes us afraid, that makes us believe the illusion of our separateness. But separateness is a lie. There are moments through music or meditation or movement or poetry, perhaps you are feeling it now when the bowl breaks, the boundaries disappear, and we are returning to the truth that we belong to one another, that we are extensions of one another. And that truth of oneness is something that we can remember if we let the song of love dance on our lips. And so Nanak began to sing, traveled the countryside, singing the song of love. And those who followed him were called Sikhs, S-I-K-H, students or seekers of truth. And Sikhs soon became known as warriors, for if I see you as my sister, my brother, and I choose to let your grief into my heart, and I choose to fight for you, that means to fight for you when you are in harm's way. We became known as Sant Sepahi. Sant Sepahi, sage warriors or warrior sages. The warrior fights, the sage loves. I took it as a path of revolutionary love. It took me many years to remember the story that I heard as a child, the song of love without limit. It took me yet many, many years because you see, after Bobir uncle was killed after 9-11, I went on to become a civil rights lawyer. And I believed that just policy was all we needed. 
with every film, with every campaign, with every lawsuit. I have finally come to understand that sound government is necessary to transition our nation, but it is not sufficient. We need just policy, but just policy will not hold without a culture that affirms the love at the root of it. What we need now is a shift in culture and consciousness, a new way of seeing and being that leaves no one behind, a love without limit, a revolution of the heart, revolutionary love. You see, it's only now as a mother, 20 years later, <laughs> that I am returning to love as the call of our times, revolutionary love as the call of our times, and understanding that the song of love that I heard when I was a child, you have heard it too. When did you first hear it? Jesus called us to love thy neighbor. Mohammed to take in the orphan. Abraham to open our tent to all. Buddha taught unending compassion. Gudananik to see no stranger. Mirabai of the Hindu faith to love without end. This song of love is ancient. It comes down to us through the millennia on the lips of indigenous teachers and spiritual leaders and social reformers. They all taught us to expand the circle of who counts as one of us to include all of us. They tried to awaken us to the truth of our interdependence and our interconnectedness. And now you don't have to be part of a wisdom tradition to affirm this truth of our oneness, do you? For the science is increasingly verifying what our teachers have long taught us, that we are made of the same stuff of stars, that we can trace our bodies back to a common ancestry, that inside your lungs and my lungs are circulating atoms that were inside the lungs of long dead ancestors, that we can look upon anything and say as a biological fact, cosmological fact, as well as a spiritual truth, you are a part of me I do not yet know. Then why is it? If this call to love is ancient, if we have heard it coursing through our spiritual traditions, the mystical river that flows through all of the great wisdom traditions of humanity, why is it that we have the world we have now? Divide it, torment it, violent, unequal. You see, for too long, have societies been structured along a hierarchy of human value. Every society around the globe and through history has been organized by a hierarchy of human value, some more insidious than others. And the oldest hierarchy of human value on US soil is supported by the story, the lie of white supremacy. To undo the lie, we have to dismantle the logic that whiteness is equal to superiority, whether we affirm it explicitly or implicitly. For every institution on the soil, the air that we breathe carries this lie. The only way forward on this soil is to center black lives. For there is no collective liberation without black liberation in America. The only way to move forward is to begin with indigenous history and memory. For their memory is the true starting point of the history of the Americas and they already survived the apocalypse. They have something to teach us about how to get through the transition we are in now. The only way forward is to follow the leadership of women of color who know in their body and breath more often than not how to leave no one behind. And the only way forward is to make sure that everyone else, including white people, are invited not just as allies, but as accomplices. 
We need you to conspire with us to remake the world, to reach out to us in that darkness, to stand in solidarity with us, to see no stranger, to risk what you might not have risked yet for that future. What if, what if this was the generation that changed the meaning of whiteness in America? What if whiteness wasn't synonymous with domination or complicity or blindness? What if to be white meant to be an accomplice? What if so many of you are the ones to change that meaning in your being, in your breath, Anti-racism is a bridge, but love is the destination. Beloved community is the destination. I am inviting you into a way of being. For to orient your life with revolutionary love, you cannot be anything other than anti-racist. That requires a commitment. It requires discipline. It's a practice so many of you have been in for a long time, haven't you? And yet with the crises that we are in now, the transition that we are in now, what does it mean to show up to that labor with even more efficiency, discipline, and clarity? I invite you to make revolutionary love your compass. For if love is not just a feeling, if love is sweet labor, fierce, bloody, imperfect, life-giving, a choice we make again and again, then love can be taught, love can be modeled, and love can be practiced. I want to give you three practices that have been life-giving to me and that I believe you are all already doing in some way. But naming these practices perhaps will give you even more tools to be able to put them into practice in your communities and your congregations. Are you ready? Revolutionary love. I define revolutionary love as the choice to labor for others, our opponents, and ourselves. How do we love others? This first practice I call See No Stranger see no stranger and it begins with wonder can you orient to all others through the ethic through the practice of wonder can you look up on the face of anyone or anything and say you are a part of me i do not yet know can you say sister brother sibling who have you not wondered about whose grief have you not let into your heart who have you not yet fought for knowing that it is always dangerous to expand that circle of who you see as one of you for what happens when we see George Floyd as brother, Brianna as sister, migrant child at the border as your own daughter? What do you risk? How do you lead your life differently? How do you make choices differently? What do you stand for? That practice of seeing no stranger means wondering about others and grieving with others and fighting with and for others. Those are the elements of deep solidarity. Shallow solidarity is based on the logic of exchange. I show up for you, so you show up for me. But no, I'm, love is not an exchange economy. <laughs> Loving another is only as deep as our capacity to grieve with each other. And our capacity to grieve with each other tells us how deep, how strong our solidarity is. I show up for you because you are my sister, my brother. I choose to love you. That's the first practice to see no stranger, for we all carry implicit bias inside of us. Within a split second before conscious thought, when we see another face, our mind decides whether they are part of our in-group or out-group. And so when we're inviting you to see no stranger, we're inviting you, I'm inviting you to retrain your eye to see differently, to be differently. And from how you see differently, then all your actions follow. That's the first practice, to see no stranger. What happens when the person in front of you is an opponent? Practice number two is tend the wound. Tend the wound. You see, there are no such thing as monsters in this world. There are only human beings who are wounded, 
who act out of their own insecurity or blindness or greed, just like my friend's parents storming the Capitol building that does not make them any less dangerous, but when I see the wound in them, I drain them of their power over me. I understand what drives them. It is not just a moral act, it is a strategic act, it is a pragmatic act. I get smarter about how I change the cultures and the context and the institutions that radicalize them, that authorize them to continue. That practice of tending the wound, to be able to orient to your opponent with wonder, it requires you to tend your own wound first. I invite people to honor their rage. I invite you to honor your rage. Your rage carries information and energy. Your rage shows you that you have something worth fighting for, worth protecting. I know so many people from faith traditions who say, no, 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 I'm only as good or as spiritual as my ability to choke down my rage. But I say to you, my love, remember the fury in the eyes of Jesus when he overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. Remember the anger in the eyes of Guru Gobind Singh when he went to war against empire. The solution is not to suppress your rage or to let it explode. The solution is to process your rage in safe containers, to give, them ex give it expression, to ask yourself what information does my rage carry, and then to decide how to direct that energy into what you want to do next. That harnessed energy I call divine rage. Divine rage. The aim of divine rage is not vengeance. The aim of divine rage is to reorder the world. Sometimes that next action means sitting with opponents and listening to them to try to understand them, try to tend to their wound. And when you do this, when you tend to your own wound, when you tend to the wound in your opponents, you're gathering information for how to reimagine, not just resist, 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 as so many of us have been. So resistance is vital for survival, but in order to change the power dynamics that are, we have to reimagine solutions that might free all of us. I know this is hard. The hardest labor of all, isn't it? 15 years after Bulbir uncle was killed, I started to wonder about his murderer in prison. And Bobir uncle's brother, Ranaji, and I, we called, we called Frank Roke in prison. He said to us, when I go to heaven to be judged by God, I will ask to see your brother, and I will hug him, and I will ask for his forgiveness. And we told him, Rana told him, we've already forgiven you. Forgiveness is not freedom from hate. <laughs> Forgiveness is not forgetting, my love. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is freedom from hate. To be honest, I needed that animosity. I needed that hate. I carried it around with me for 15 years. For 15 years, I needed to grieve. I needed to rage. I need others to love me well, to process, to heal, to get to the point where I could wonder about Bobby, your uncle's killer. And at that point, I looked at this hatred that I was carrying around and I realized, like, I don't need this anymore. Sometimes forgiveness comes at the very end of a healing process like it did for me and Rana. Other times forgiveness comes at the very beginning like it did for the family members who lost their loved ones in Charleston in the massacre who looked in the face of Dylan Roof and said, I forgave you, I forgive you. I did not understand it then, but I understand it now. It was an act of audacity. It was an act of agency. It was them saying that you cannot make me hate you. You cannot take that away from me too. So for some of us, forgiveness comes at the beginning of that healing journey. For others, it comes at the very end. Still others may not ever choose to forgive at all. It is up to the survivor to decide. What I do wish to tell you is that forgiveness is for you, not for them. It's for you. For once I finally was able to forgive Frank Roque, I could feel myself free of the weight, the burden of the hate that I was carrying around. 
When I wondered about him, I could hear his story. I could see his wound. He was no longer a monster who had so much power over me. He was a frail and wounded man who thought he was protecting his country by taking Bobir uncle 20 years ago. His aggression, like so much white nationalist aggression, is a symptom of unresolved grief. They are grieving the notion that this nation ever belonged just to them in the first place. It doesn't make the grief legitimate. But understanding it gives me information for how to hold up a vision of an America that includes them too, that they too might have a place in. And that's why. That's why on January 6th, when I looked at my friend's parents, I knew that redemption might not happen in this lifetime, but I could open up the possibility that in 20 years, just like with Bobir uncle, they might be able to sit with me and see even me as daughter. I want to be clear here. Everyone has a different role in the work of revolutionary love at any given time. Revolutionary love is not the sacrifice of an individual. It is the practice of a community. And so if you are someone who has a knee on your neck, it is not necessarily your role to look up at that opponent, opponent and try to wonder about them, try to love them. Your role is to take the next breath. That is your revolutionary act. Just like it's not my role to sit with those parents of my friend, it's her role perhaps, but not mine. So if you are someone who is safe enough and brave enough to sit with those kinds of people, relatives and friends and congregants, we need you now. We need you to do that labor that I cannot do. We need you to sit in the fire of those emotions and be able to stay in relationship with those who would otherwise be cast out for who will reach them if not you. Isolation breeds radicalization, says Hannah Arendt. Who will reach them if not you? We all have a different role at any given time and the transformation that might come with listening, with loving is long and it's hard and that brings me to the third practice. So. Practice number one is see no stranger. Practice number two is tend the wound. Practice number three is breathe and push. It's how to love ourselves. You see, when I became an activist 20 years ago, I just thought if I just pushed hard enough and long enough, then it would be okay. 20 years later, here I am. Here we are still facing the crises, still reeling from the massacres. I have come to understand that the labor for justice has gone on before I was born and will go on after I die, but that I, but that we have a very particular role to play in this era of transition to show up to the labor in front of us. How do we do that? How do we find resilience when the labor feels endless? This is where the wisdom of the midwife will help us. She doesn't say breathe once and then push and keep pushing. No, she says, breathe my love and then push and then breathe again. There is a, there is a rhythm, there is a cadence to sustaining resilience and longevity in any long labor. The labor of leading a church or raising a family or building a movement or rebirthing a country. How are you breathing each day? How are you weaving breath into your labors? And this is where so many of you, as part of this conference, this morning I heard you sing and worship. You know how to breathe and you know how to rest. You know because your scriptures and your songs and rituals create containers for that kind of contemplation. Who can you invite into those spaces? Or who can you help breathe who are outside of those spaces? You see, self-care is an inaccurate term. 
when no one goes to battle alone, no one gives birth alone. We need community care. We need midwives at our side. We need to be breathing together and then pushing together. So what push are you ready for, my love? What new energy can you draw to push, to show up to the labor in ways that maybe you have not before? What daring thing, what brave thing, what is waiting for you? Can you imagine drawing upon that ancestral courage now to resolve in your heart to do that thing, to let love be your compass to show up to that thing, to breathe and push with love as your guide? That is the third practice. See no stranger, tend the wound, and breathe and push. We need all three kinds of practices for love to be revolutionary in our congregations, in our communities. Loving just ourselves, that is escapism. So we can be, bre we can be praying and singing and taking care of our own bodies and think that if I'm healing myself, I'm healing the world. If I'm praying hard enough, then my prayers will reach the world. And that is necessary, but not sufficient. If you're just doing that, that is a form of spiritual bypassing. If you are just loving your opponents, if you're just focusing on that, there's a few people who fall into that category. Not many of us, but few of us who at their own expense, who you know are rushing to forgiveness, who believe that love is civility, who are just trying to say the sweet words to make the opponent feel better, that that is self-loathing, that is self-destructive, that is not serving the movement. So loving just ourselves is escapism. Loving just opponents is a kind of loathing, self-loathing. Loving just others, just engaging in those acts of solidarity, that is powerful stuff, but it is inefficient. You see, so many of our movements for justice are based on this model of solidarity alone without teaching our people how to love themselves well enough so that they are not burning out or opting out or taking their lives or letting their lives be taken. How do we teach our young people in particular to give them the tools to care for themselves, to breathe between their labors, to let joy in? And similarly, how many of us are starting to mirror the vitriol that we're trying to fight? We cannot become what we're fighting. We cannot dehumanize our opponents in the process as much as it might feel good in the short term. It burns us in the long term. We do not make progress. So loving just ourselves is escapism. Loving just opponents is self-loathing. Loving just others is ineffective. But if we are part of communities, where we're practicing love in these three directions, where we're asking ourselves, what is my role in this moment? Where do I need to be? Where am I positioned? Where is my family? Where is my congregation positioned? Is it time for me to reach out in solidarity with others? Is it time for me to reach out to those opponents? Is it time for me to create spaces for us to love ourselves well? You will know that the deepest wisdom inside of you will know which practice you need at any given moment. I believe revolutionary love is the call of our times because I have a particular theory of change. Revolutions happen not only in the big grand moments in public view, they also happen in the spaces where people are coming together to inhabit a new way of being, a new way of seeing. Imagine, imagine if a critical mass of us were equipped with the tools to build beloved community where we are. Every home, every church, every house of worship, every school, every industry, every place that holds community. If a critical mass of us was starting to put these practices more intentionally into action, creating spaces to grieve together, to rage together, to wonder about one another, to fight for one another, to reimagine together, to breathe together, to push together. Isn't that the shift in culture and consciousness that might shift the nation as a whole? 
if we could equip a critical mass of us to do it here and now, then we are the midwives to the world that is longing to be born. In the Sikh faith, we have a concept called Chardikala. I remember walking into the bedroom of Baba Punjab Singh, a Sikh grandfather who was once a great orator, but he had been hit by bullets in the mass shooting in Oak Creek, Wisconsin at the hands of a white supremacist, not unlike the mass shooting that devastated the Tree of Life synagogue and took so many lives in Pittsburgh. Baba Punjab Singh did not die right away. He was paralyzed, unable to move or speak, lying on his hospital bed for months and then years. Every time I walked into his bedroom, it was the same. He, he looked like my grandfather, a turban and white beard. How ironic that these very articles of faith meant to demonstrate our commitment to love and serve all have been the very things that have marked us for violence, marked us as terrorists here in this country. Looking into Baba Punjab Singh's face, I would always feel such deep pain. But his son would always ask him, Papaji, father, are you in Chardikala? Are you in Chardikala? Chardikala in the Sikh faith means ever rising spirits, even in darkness, ever rising joy even in darkness. So here was his son asking Baba Punjab Singh, who could not move or speak save for blinking his eyes, are you in Jardikala? And Baba Punjab Singh would always blink twice. Yes. I am in Jardikala. If Baba Punjab Singh could be in Chardikala until his dying breath. He died just last year. Then so can I. And so can you. Can we reclaim joy as part of the labor, part of the struggle for justice? Can we labor for a more just and beautiful world with love and with joy. For I have come to believe that staying faithful to that labor for all the days of our lives with joy can be the meaning of life. One day, my love, you will be an ancestor. You will be an ancestor. They will gather in spaces like this, maybe virtual, maybe 3D holograms. I can't even imagine. Can you? They will gather. As human beings gather, they will gather and they will summon you. When asked who are the ancestors, they will say your name. They will summon you. They will put your name into the chat. They will call upon you. When they call upon you, If we show up with love, they will not inherit our trauma from these years. They will inherit our bravery, born of joy. Thank you so much. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. You can take a breath. I'm gonna take a breath. I'm going to drink my, my tea. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you now. We have a good 25 minutes, and it's just you and me. And there is a Q&A box here. And any questions you have, any thoughts you have, any feelings, any, any reactions that you have, I invite you to type it into the, into the Q&A box. That's where I'll see it. And as you're gathering your thoughts, I'm going to give you one resource. And maybe someone can put it into the chat. We have created um, a revolutionary love learning hub, a learning hub, and we've just released it. And so if anything that you have heard tonight has spoken to you, 
then I invite you to, to go to this learning hub and you'll see educational curricula for high schools, for colleges, for faith leaders. You'll see home practices, you'll see teaching videos, you'll see music and artwork and illustrations. The music that you heard at the top of the hour was a song called Revolutionary Love by Ani DeFranco, who has been taking these words from my book and the words that you've just heard and working her alchemy and turning them into music for the movement. We're gonna end our session tonight with a song that we'll all dance out to too, called See No Stranger. So if you want to experience these tools, this music, this work, and you wanna bring it into your life, or into your congregation, go ahead and check out that learning hub because that learning hub is accessible and almost everything there is available for free. And my commitment to you is to stay and play this particular role in the labor for the next 25 years. For the length of this transition, I will be here to try to equip you with the tools to practice revolutionary love and to build beloved community where you are. And I present this as a new framework, right? But you know, we know that this stuff is ancient. <laughs> We're just simply reclaiming love for a new era, for a new time, for here and now. Oh, Adriana has asked me a question. She says, what can you do if you've lost your joy? Oh, my love, I know. I know some nights are so dark, you just feel the despair, right? I want to invite you into a different relationship with joy. I've discovered that joy is not something I can bottle up and carry around with me and keep into my life and make sure it happens to me every day or I can access it every day. Some days it's hard to feel joy. You feel like you've lost it. But my love, joy is not something that you seize and carry around. That's not at least how it's felt to me. Joy is something that comes and sweeps me up. I cannot force it. In the Sikh faith, we say, are you in Chardikala? Are you in it? Like, it's not something that you have. It's something that has, has you. <laughs> it's like, are you in the current? Are you in the river? Has it swept you? Has it taken you? And sometimes there are days, there are long droughts where I am not swept up into the river. And when you find yourself in those moments, I invite you to do this, to simply look around. You can do it right now. Look around the space you're in, the room that you're in, and let your eyes fall on the most beautiful thing that you see. It could be a face of someone you love in a photo it could be a plant. It could be a tree. I'm looking at the palm tree out my window. You got it? You see the thing? All right, just notice how the color changes with the light that's falling on it. Notice what makes it beautiful. And now I invite you to say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. you say it? It may feel kind of silly if you're saying this to a house plant, but I invite you to say it <laughs> because my love, it's true. Can you wonder about this thing? Can you let awe in? Where did it come from? What was it composed of? What will it one be? Lose yourself to the wonder. Once you decenter yourself a little bit, once you surrender your senses to the present moment, once you orient to something on the outside of you and realize that it is a part of you, that the universe is a part of you, I notice that the delight of being alive here and now makes it easier for joy to come and find me. Joy is like this sparkling, rising energy in the body. And even if sometimes it's like a torrent, but sometimes it's just a little bit. And so if it's hard to find, just focus on that little bit, that little sparkly energy rising in you. So there it is, just a glimmer. 
and now find someone who you can share this beautiful thing with. And I guarantee you, if you're finding someone else and say, look and say this, you might start laughing. There might be a little bit of joy that enters, right? <laughs> Here's what I know. When I was on the birthing table, birthing my babies and I was screaming and it was all fire and death, my husband still made me laugh. Joy. When I was next to my beautiful mother figure, Joyce, and I was helping her die on her deathbed, her last hours of life, she still told a joke and made me laugh. Joy. Joy is possible amid all our great labors in life. The labor of birthing, the labor of dying, and the labors in between. When you give your senses over to the present moment, when you choose to laugh with someone, to show them something, to let wonder come to you. So do not force it, my love. Just notice it when it comes. And when you place your attention on it, that feeling, that energy just might grow and just might carry you into the current. Oh, such gorgeous questions. Here you are. Okay, Tom is asking, thank you for your work, your spirit, your words this evening. You have fleshed out revolutionary love in a way that is accessible and helpful. I am so happy to hear that, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I created this compass in a way to save my own life. I did not know how to find joy when the labor for justice was so hard and so long. And so what we've created was a way I have, you know, something I have put into practice now that I'm back in this country. Now I feel like I will be able to last. I want to grow old. I want to grow old with you. And so anything that you can take into your life, please do. What does the joy look like in reclaiming joy? This is where if you're interested in the joy practice, I invite you to go to that learning hub and click on that. We have ten, the 10 core practices of revolutionary love and one of them is joy. Click on that joy. It's like you're entering a door and then you'll see all of these practices that might give you ways in, ways to reclaim. Another practice that I have is dance time every night with my children. Some nights I do not feel like dancing. I'm like, I'm like a zombie. Like, why am I dancing on the night when we've had the death toll is this high, when I've come back from this memorial, when these protests are underway? Why? And my son turns up the music and it's, baby, you're a firework. That returns me to Jardinica. Suddenly I'm swaying and he's laughing and I'm laughing. My daughter is squealing and I'm squealing and we're dancing. We're dancing on the darkest night. So sometimes you have to let your, you know, pull your body into a place where you're letting energy move through you and then it's easier to feel that sparkly energy rise. So that's another trick. Dance time. <laughs> um, Becky is asking what brings you hope these days. I have to be honest with you. I was all about hope and change. That was my phrase. That was my frame for a good part of my 20s. And these days, <laughs> I'm like, okay, hope is some a feeling that comes and goes like sometimes like hope is so big and luminous like a full moon in the sky i'm like i see the future what gives me hope is you like i see solidarity i haven't seen before i see a new generation rising up and declaring you know that the shared future like we've been we've been seeing on the streets of gaza and israel like there, there are moments where i see like glimmers of this hope and i feel the hope in my body and there are other nights i have to be honest where there is no hope at all where it's just like a new moon i know it's there i think it's there but i cannot see it and i cannot feel it those are the days i still do dance time <laughs> you see on the hopeless nights you can still do the things that might invite joy in might invite joy in to take you. Hope is a feeling that comes and goes. What matters is the work that your hands do. And I find that if I can bring joy into the struggle as a daily practice, as a daily invitation, then my body has energy for my hands to show up and continue to do the work until there might be a little bit of a moment of hope that finds me again. Katriona is asking, can you expand a bit more on the transition stage of the labor that we are in as a society? The image of the darkness of the tomb versus the darkness of the womb is so powerful. How do you see new life being birthed in these dark times in which we are living? Mm. Here is where the transition metaphor is really useful to me, Katriona. In birthing labor, progress is cyclical, not linear, it is cyclical. When Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, I, I still had this like line in my mind, right? It's like this line of forward progress and he never told us the shape that progress takes. 
if linear progress is our metric for success, then of course it feels like we are just going backwards, that all is lost, right? But if we're thinking about the stage of transition and birthing labor, transition is the most painful and dangerous stage in labor. It's the final stage. It's when the body expands to 10 centimeters and the contractions are so fast, there's barely time to breathe between them. It feels like dying. And yet it's precisely in transition you know, it's transition that precedes the birth of new life. It's transition that asks us to pull forth a bravery we did not know we had. Transition too is cyclical, right? Breathe, my love, then push, and then breathing, and contraction will come, and then there's a release, and then it comes, and then it's a release. The reason this is useful for me when I think about the story of America as one long labor, I'll give you an example of, of the summer of 2020. In the wake of George Floyd's murder, to see the horrific police violence and the reaction of too many, it felt like 1992. It felt like 1968 to so many of my black kindred. They were saying nothing has changed. This feels like what we've been through so many times before. I felt that. Indianapolis, right? Indianapolis, the massacre in Indianapolis on sick Americans felt like the massacre on six in Oak Creek. In 2012, it felt like what happened to Bobir Uncle and too many of us in, in the aftermath of 9-11. How many times do we have to go through the trauma? In birthing labor, each trauma, each contraction feels like the one before it, but there's one difference. It's you. You've gained a little bit more information about how to breathe and how to push. You're opening up a little bit more space than there was before. In 1968 and 1992, we did not see white people and Asian people and Latinx people standing in the street for black lives. That is new, the multiracial coalition that has risen, that is still rising for black lives is new. We've opened up a little bit more space for equality, for solidarity, for liberation than there was before. And the, the body and labor, you remember, just like our ancestors, we remember what our ancestors have gone through before. The body and labor gains more and more information about how to breathe and how to push, and each time a little bit more space opens up. So progress is cyclical, and that gives me hope too to answer your question, Becky, when I see a little bit more opening up than before. Here's the thing, I don't know how many turns to the cycle it's going to take before we birth a new America, before we birth a sustainable world, I don't know. All I know is that I want to do my part to show up to the labor when it's my time in the cycle. You know, show up to the labor in front of me. So that is where transition is very useful. And transition, no one should transition alone. You need midwives at your side. And when I was in transition, that's when I saw my grandmother standing behind my mother and her mother before her and her mother before her and all the women who had pushed through the fire before me. It was ancestral connection and solidarity with that's what helped me breathe and push so that's why that's why we did so much work tonight of calling forth ancestors of connecting to one another to remembering that separateness is an illusion that you are not alone with the labor in front of you jill says your description of love reminds me of dorothy day we have learned that the only solution is love and that love comes with community has she been one of your influencing ancestors? She has, she has, she has. You'll see her quoted in See No Stranger. You'll see many social reformers who've gone before me, before us, quoted and, and referenced and ignited in the book from Audre Lorde to Bell Hooks to Dr. King. I think what, um, what, what inspires me when I go back to Day or when I go back to Bell Hooks even is that this calling for love to be a public ethic, to be a foundation in all arenas of our society, that that vision is, is not a new one. You know, what, what, what is new is that, is what W.H. Auden says, we must love one another now or die. Like this shift in consciousness that our visionaries have been calling us to for so many hundreds of years, it must happen now. It must happen now if the human race is to survive. And each of us has a role. You have a role. 
Your waking is essential. Your breathing is essential. Your pushing is essential. Your labor is essential. Your love is essential. So yes, with ancestors at our back. Um, Kristen says, I'm absolutely loving everything you are saying. Thank you for mentioning Mother Emanuel in Charleston. My friend and colleague, Reverend Clementa Pinkney, um, Pinky, was murdered by Dylan Roof. She was your friend. Oh, Kristen. I oppose the death penalty for him. Rather, I want to know how we made him. I still shake when I think of that season. I am shaking with you, my love. And I want to honor and witness your audacity to wonder about how Dylan Roof was made. That kind of thinking, that kind of revolutionary thinking, that insistence to see him not as a monster, but a brother who was lost, a brother who was made by our culture, by this culture. Only with that kind of orientation can we begin to make choices in our own communities that catch those who might become Dylan Roof in the future. So thank you, Kristen, for modeling that. Um, thank you, Adriana. And, um, oh great, there's another who says, as director of spiritual formation in my church, I intend to introduce the revolutionary love materials in my practice. Oh, that's beautiful. And I want to say to you that um, what we've seen, we just released the Learning Hub a week or two ago. It's been so recent. But what we've seen is um, church leaders in particular who are taking the Revolutionary Love Compass and my book, See No Stranger, and building sermon series out of love for others, love for opponents, love for ourselves, drawing from Christian scripture and infusing Christian scripture in it. It's so, so brilliant, dazzling to see. I've seen church leaders lead um, book clubs where they're reading See No Stranger. And sometimes there's 10 core practices and 10 chapters of the book. So they'll take the book and they'll take the materials on the learning hub and structure a course over 10 days or 10 weeks or 10 months so you could spend an entire month on wonder and another on grieve and another on fight and because so many so much of this work is about reprogramming about retraining the eye about orienting the body you know it's not just an idea that we're holding it's a way of being that we're inviting people to live into more and more and more taking time with the materials seems to be really fruitful and doing it in community is, has been really exciting. We've also been approached by educators who want to make revolutionary love the ethic of their school culture and have the compass be a common vocabulary. My, my son's preschool is having all the teachers read the book and beginning to teach the children. They already know how to wonder, but really how to protect that wonder, how to nurture that wonder, how to allow it to grow. And I think about wonder as the building block for love and for justice. I think about when I'm walking with my two-year-old, my daughter, on Friday mornings, we go for this walk to the sea and we pass so many things. And I think like, how do I, you know, nurture the wonder that's already inside of her? And so we've been singing the song that I want to share with you. Are you ready? <laughs> Ants on a leaf, birds in the sky, sweet little bee, tree so high. Wonder baby says, wow, whoa, you're a part of me. I don't yet know. <laughs> Wonder is our birthright. It is her birthright. So when I ask her to look upon anything and say, you are part of me, I don't yet know. It's I'm asking her to look at not just the animals and the earth, but other people and, and even people who are in harm's way and, and invite her to think about how wonder is the building block for love and for justice. So soon you'll see on the Revolutionary Love Learning Hub, there will be materials for children as well and for families. And I'm turning this Wonder Baby song into a book. So hopefully there'll be more coming from me as well. But oh, there's so many places, so many sources that you can bring into your life. And let, let this just be among them. Um, oh, Reverend Robin Haruna says, just finished a six week sermon series with accompanying book discussions during the week and it was very well received that is amazing that is amazing oh okay kathleen how do you invite others to share in creating the vision kathleen i'm so glad you asked this because um we're just getting started and everything that i have created we have created as a project has been in community and in collaboration even the revolutionary love compass we worked with a team of researchers from 
multiple disciplines in order to inform it. The educator's guide that you see on the Learning Hub, that was um, spearheaded by Dr. Melissa Canlas, who is our education director, but also a professor at University of San Francisco in education. Since she's a college professor, she knows what she needs to be able to practice to teach revolutionary love in her college classroom. So we've been approached by others. You know the you know the context in which you work. You know you if you're whether you're a medical health professional or a faith leader or um, an educator of, of a different kind, you know your sphere more than anyone else. So we have a, a frequently asked questions and FAQ on the Learning Hub. You click on that, you'll see a feedback form. And if you are someone who is interested in taking the compass and taking these materials and tailoring them for your particular context, we want to be in communication with you. We want to hear from you. And we're going to go slow. We're going slow and we're deliberate. We're building capacity. But eventually, we want to be able to create all of these tailored materials to meet people where they are. Because Kathleen, you know, you know, you have expertise that we do not know about your community and how to bring this to your community. So yeah, it's a collaboration. Um, yes, uh, another person has asked if I've been inspired by Joanna Macy and Bishop Yvette Flunder, um, two inspirational women in California. I don't know jo Joanna, but, but Bishop Flunder is a big sister to me. We're part of a, a fellowship called the Auburn C Senior Fellows, along with Reverend William Barber and Sister Simone Campbell and Rabbi Sharon Browse. And oh, Bishop Flunder's songs. She, when we come together, she always sings, and that's always when I'm really feeling like really dark and down. When she sings, I just feel that oh, I'm in charge of the Goliaths. Found me again. So she has been uh, a beloved big sister to me. Thank you for asking. Oh, Sarah's asking how do people get out of their silos? I think. I think it can really only truly happen in relationship. The algorithms have created the silos, have created the echo chambers, both online and our divided racial life, right? So to have the courage to go to the margins of what you know, to be in relationship with those who you would otherwise not be, is a way to break those silos. And in relationship comes story, and in story comes transformation. So it's up to us. It's up to each of us to go to the places where we have not yet been and start to seed relationships there and perhaps nurture pockets of revolutionary love in the places that most need it. We are at time and I have answered all of these questions, I hope. <laughs> um, I'm so moved to spend this evening with you. This time with you has brought me joy and I just want to, to end with a heartfelt thank you to the Henderson family. I've been looking and understanding Reverend Henderson's life and his commitment, his faithfulness to the labor for so many years and thinking, okay, ancestors like that model for us how to be and how if we show up like them, how we might be remembered, how we might leave our babies and their babies a world that is more just and beautiful, the world that we dream. So let us stay in that labor together. Thank you, everyone. Helen, thank you. I invite you back. Thank you, Valerie. In turn, I would like to invite my friend and colleague, Liddy Barlow, to offer a closing benediction to bring all of this around full circle. Thank you, Liddy. Well, thanks so much, Valerie and Helen. It's been a wonderful first day, and we're all um, so, so deeply grateful and looking forward to tomorrow. Friends, will you receive this blessing? May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Sarah and Hagar, Rebecca, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, God, creator and mystery called by holy people everywhere, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, God of the ancestors, known and unknown, transform us into the ancestors we dream. Nurture in us the practices of love. Keep us in this labor and help us to reach out our hands in the dark to those who need it most. And may God, who is creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, dwell among us and grant us peace. 
Amen.